Level zero, two to four inches of snow accumulates over six to eight hours. That's a light snow event forming when a weak low pressure area pulls limited moisture through sub-freezing air. Precipitation falls at half an inch per hour, sometimes less. Visibility stays above a quarter mile. You can see buildings across the street, parked cars gradually turning white. This is baseline winter weather above the 40th parallel. Surface temperature between 28 and 32 degrees Fahrenheit, relative humidity above 70%, weak lift mechanism pushing air upward. The snow crystals are dendritic or stellar, light and fluffy, with a snow to liquid ratio of 15 to 1 or even 20 to 1. Road crews handle this with a single plow pass and salt. Traffic slows by 10 to 15 percent. Minor fender benders tick up, schools stay open. Businesses operate normally. Meteorologists predict these systems three to five days out with accuracy rates above 85 percent. Everything behaves as the equations predict. The snow stops within 12 hours, temperature stays below freezing or rises, and everything melts within 48 hours. The disruption is temporary and manageable. Children make snowmen that survive a day or two before collapsing into slush. Homeowners clear driveways in 20 minutes. The world continues functioning with minor adjustment. This snow is an inconvenience, not a threat. The atmospheric conditions are simple. A surface low tracking through, pulling just enough moisture, just cold enough for snow instead of rain. Radar shows the precipitation shield moving at a predictable pace. Models agree within a few miles on the track. The storm arrives when forecasted, drops what was predicted, and departs on schedule. But when accumulation rates double and systems refuse to move, predictability collapses entirely. Level 1. 6 to 12 inches falling over 12 to 18 hours. Snowfall rates hit 1 to 2 inches per hour during heavy bands. The National Weather Service issues winter storm warning. This is where snow becomes an operational challenge. The storm structure is organized now. A deepening low-pressure system with comma head shape on satellite. Multiple precipitation bands wrapping around the center. The surface low pulls gulf moisture northward, while cold air dams in from Canada. Where they collide, snow piles up. Visibility drops to a quarter mile or less. Highway speeds decrease 30 to 40 percent. Commute times triple. The accident rate increases by a factor of 3 to 5. Road crews work 12-hour shifts but clear the same routes repeatedly. Wet snow events near 32 degrees drop the snow to liquid ratio to 10 to 1 or even 5 to 1. Heavy, dense adhesive snow sticks to power lines and branches. Tree limbs crack and fall. Scattered power outages affect 2 to 5% of customers. The storm clears within 24 to 36 hours. Cleanup takes another day or two. Total disruption, 3 to 4 days. These storms happen multiple times per winter in northern regions. Expected, planned for, budgeted. Municipalities have salt stockpiles measured in thousands of tons. Plow routes are mapped and optimized. Emergency services adapt protocols. Schools implement closure criteria based on accumulation thresholds and timing. The infrastructure groans but holds. Grocery stores experience runs on bread and milk. Hardware stores sell out of shovels and ice melt. Then it's over. The snow gets cleared. Life returns to normal within a week. But there's a version where the wind doesn't just blow. It erases the world from view. Level 2. The definition is specific. Sustained winds or gusts exceeding 35 miles per hour. Visibility reduced to a quarter mile or less. Conditions persisting for at least three hours. The wind makes it lethal. Snowfall might be moderate, but wind redistributes everything. Ground blizzards occur when strong winds pick up existing snow, creating whiteout conditions with no new precipitation. Snow becomes airborne, horizontal. Visibility drops to zero. You cannot distinguish the sky from the ground. Spatial reference vanishes. Driving becomes impossible. Vehicles get buried in their windows within an hour. Snow drifts form with strategic malice, filling depressions, blocking gaps. A road plowed two hours ago is covered with four-foot drifts. Wind chill temperatures plunge. At zero degrees with 50 mile per hour winds, wind chill hits minus 40. Frostbite occurs on exposed skin within five minutes. Core temperature drops if exposure continues. The 2016 Mid-Atlantic blizzard dropped 20 to 30 inches with wind gusts to 60 miles per hour. Zero visibility conditions lasted over 12 hours. 55 people died several from exposure after becoming disoriented in whiteouts. Orientation loss is documented. People walk 50 yards to their barn and cannot find their way back. They wander in circles covering hundreds of yards. Bodies are recovered after the storm, frozen within sight of safety. The psychological effect is profound. In whiteout conditions, the human brain cannot process the visual input. Vertigo sets in. People lose sense of up and down. They fall into ditches they cannot see. Rescuers find victims who traveled in completely wrong direction, sometimes away from safety they were trying to reach. The wind doesn't just reduce visibility, it creates acoustic confusion, making it impossible to hear landmarks or other people calling. 
These blizzards last 12 to 18 hours, but what if the pattern locks and snow doesn't stop for days? Level 3. Most systems move through in 24 to 36 hours, but sometimes the jet stream creates a block. High pressure parks north, low pressure stalls south. The moisture conveyor doesn't shut off. Snow falls for two, three, sometimes more days. The Great Blizzard of 1978 saw snow falling continuously, February 5th through 7th. Boston, 27 inches. Providence, 38 inches. Some suburbs, 50 inches. Winds of 40 to 50 miles per hour with gusts to 80 created drifts 15 to 20 feet high. Over 100 people died. 10,000 vehicles abandoned on Route 128. By day two, infrastructure breaks down. Roof collapses begin on commercial buildings. Wet snow weighs 15 to 20 pounds per cubic foot. Three feet equals 45 to 60 pounds per square foot. Many buildings are designed for 20 to 30. Structural capacity is exceeded. Beams fail. Food distribution fractures. Trucks can't move. Store shelves empty within 48 hours. Heating failures climb. When heating fails in sub-zero temperatures, Interior temperatures drop to freezing within six to eight hours. The Buffalo blizzard of December 2022 killed 47 people, 52 inches over four days, sustained winds of 40 to 50 miles per hour. Emergency services couldn't respond. People died in cars, homes, on their own streets. Bodies recovered days later, some feet from doorways they couldn't find. The psychological toll compounds with each additional day. Claustrophobia sets in as people remain trapped indoors. Isolation becomes acute when power and communications fail. Medical emergencies become death sentences when roof collapses begin on commercial buildings. Dialysis patients miss treatments. Insulin runs out. Medications cannot be refilled. The social fabric begins tearing as normal support systems collapse under the weight of continuous snow. But all this assumes precipitation falls frozen. What if it falls liquid and freezes on contact? Level 4. The atmospheric profile must be precise. Warm air above freezing at 3,000 to 6,000 feet. Sub-freezing air at surface. Rain stays liquid through the warm layer but remains supercooled until impact, then instantly freezes into glaze ice. Glaze ice bonds with hundreds of pounds per square inch tensile strength. A quarter inch adds 500 pounds to power line spans. Half an inch brings down mature trees. An inch is a regional disaster. The ice storm of 1998 brought two to four inches of ice to Quebec, Ontario, and the Northeast. 130 high-voltage transmission towers collapsed. Over 30,000 utility poles snapped. Four million people lost power. Some areas, six weeks without electricity. In January, below zero. The Canadian military deployed 15,000 troops. 35 people died from hypothermia. Hundreds more from carbon monoxide poisoning using improvised heating. Urban forests lose 20 to 50% of canopy in severe ice storms. Recovery? Decades. As ice begins melting, chunks detach from elevated surfaces. A 10-pound piece falling from 40 feet hits with over 400 foot-pounds of energy. People die annually struck by falling ice. The sound of an ice storm is distinctive. Trees crack like gunshots throughout the night. Power lines snap with explosive reports. The weight accumulates silently, then structures fail suddenly. Branches that held for hours give way without warning. Walking becomes treacherous as every surface transforms into a skating rink. Cars become encased in ice shells requiring hammers to break through. The entire landscape is frozen in place, transformed into a crystal prison that can take weeks to fully thaw. But ice storms happen locally, regionally at worst. What if I told you there's a storm system that can paralyze an entire quarter of a continent? Level 5. Nor'easters are extratropical cyclones forming off the east coast. Precipitation shields extend 500 miles. Wind fields span 1,000 miles. They affect North Carolina to Maine simultaneously, impacting 50 to 80 million people. When nor'easters undergo bombogenesis, central pressure dropping 24 millibars in 24 hours, they become meteorological bombs. The 2003 President's Day storm. Pressure dropped from 996 to 952 millibars in 24 hours. Wind gusts exceeded 80 miles per hour along the coast. Boston, 26 inches. New York, 27 inches. 27 deaths, 2 billion in damage. Nor'easters produce mesoscale bands 20 to 50 miles wide that remain stationary for hours, dumping 3 to 5 inches per hour. Forecast models struggle predicting where bands set up. Snowfall varies dramatically over short distances. Coastal flooding is equally destructive. Storms stall offshore, battering shorelines through multiple high tide cycles. Each tide brings 20 to 30 foot waves and surges of three to six feet above normal. Houses collapse into the surf. The 1996 blizzard affected 26 states, killed 154 people, and caused four billion in damage. Philadelphia, 30.7 inches. Over 100 roofs collapse. 
Interstates closed across the eastern seaboard. The storm paralyzed a quarter of the United States. The economic impact extends far beyond immediate damage. Supply chains rupture when major highways close for days. Airports cancel thousands of flights, stranding passengers across the country. Perishable goods spoil in warehouses. Manufacturing plants shut down when workers cannot reach facilities. The cascading effects propagate through the economy for weeks after the storm ends. But nor'easters are coastal phenomena, bounded by geography. What happens when the cold reaches down from the Arctic and grabs an entire continent by the throat? Level 6. Arctic outbreaks occur when the polar vortex weakens, allowing Arctic air to surge southward. Air originated over the Arctic Ocean at minus 30 to minus 50 degrees. January 2019, air temperatures of minus 30 and wind chills of minus 50 to minus 60 hit the upper Midwest. Chicago, minus 23. Exposed skin freezes in under 5 minutes. When Arctic air moves over open water, temperature differentials create explosive lake effect snow. Air at minus 20 passes over 33 degree water. The 50 plus degree gradient produces snowfall rates of 3 to 5 inches per hour. January 1977. Buffalo buried under 12 feet of snow with drifts to 30 feet. 5,000 vehicles abandoned. 29 deaths. True damage is infrastructure failure. Natural gas demand exceeds capacity. When supply drops, users lose gas service entirely during sub-zero temperatures. February 2021 Texas outbreak. Natural gas wells froze. Power plants offline. Wind turbines iced. The grid failed statewide. 4 million customers lost power in 10 to 20 degrees. 246 deaths, mostly hypothermia or carbon monoxide poisoning. The cold penetrates buildings designed for heat, not cold retention. Pipes burst in walls, flooding homes. Water mains crack under streets. Plumbing systems across entire cities fail simultaneously. The repair costs exceed billions. Communities in southern latitudes lack snow removal equipment entirely, leaving them helpless against accumulations that northern cities would clear routinely. And yet, as catastrophic as these continental-scale events are, they're still just weather. What if the snow doesn't stop for a season? For a year? For a decade? Level 7. The Little Ice Age. From 1300 to 1850 CE, global temperatures dropped 33.8 to 35.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Glaciers advanced down valleys, crushing villages. Rivers froze annually. Growing seasons shortened by two to three weeks. Regional food production collapsed. The Thames froze solid during winters of 1683 to 84, 1715 to 16, 1739 to 40. Freezes thick enough for frost fares on ice. Last fair. 1814. The river hasn't frozen since. Alpine glaciers advanced several kilometers. Chamonix glacier overran farmland and villages. Dozens of alpine villages abandoned or destroyed. Norse settlements in Greenland, abandoned by 1450. The growing season is too short. Cod fisheries moved south. Sea ice made supply voyages impossible. Grain prices during bad years tripled or quadrupled. Famines killed tens of thousands. Witch trials of the 16th and 17th centuries correlate with the worst climatic periods. Cooling was driven by decreased solar activity during the Maunder Minimum, 1645 to 1715, increased volcanic activity, and possible changes in ocean circulation. The combination shifted climate zones poleward by several hundred kilometers. Modern civilization has no experience operating in little ice age conditions. A return would require massive geographic redistribution of food production, population, and resources. International borders don't accommodate climate migration. The agricultural belts would shift hundreds of miles toward the equator. Canada's breadbasket would become Arctic tundra. European grain production would collapse. The geopolitical consequences would dwarf the climate effects themselves as billions attempt migration toward habitable zones. But the Little Ice Age was a cold snap. For true Ice Age conditions, you need glaciers burying entire continents. Level 8. The past 2.58 million years have oscillated between glacial and interglacial periods. We're currently in the Holocene, which began 11,700 years ago. Interglacials typically last 10,000 to 30,000 years. Ours is mature. During the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, ice sheets covered Canada, the northern United States to the 40th parallel, Scandinavia, northern Europe. The Laurentide ice sheet was up to two miles thick at its center. The ice sheets held so much water that global sea levels dropped by 120 meters, approximately 400 feet. Continental shelves became dry land. Britain connected to continental Europe. The Bering Land Bridge was an exposed landmass 1,000 miles wide. The ice weight deformed Earth's crust, pressing it downward. Hudson Bay experienced the most depression. Crust pushed down over 600 meters. Areas are still rebounding today. 
Temperature reconstructions show average global temperatures were 39.2 to 44.6 degrees Fahrenheit, colder than present. Most of Canada would be under ice or polar desert. Northern Europe would be tundra. Glacial periods last 80,000 to 100,000 years. Interglacials last 10,000 to 30,000 years. Based on orbital mechanics, the next glacial period should begin within a few thousand years. However, atmospheric CO2 is currently at 420 parts per million, compared to glacial levels of 180 and interglacial levels of 280. The excess CO2 may delay or prevent the next glaciation entirely. The ice advances at walking pace, meters per year, but it never stops. Cities would be ground to dust under the advancing ice. All infrastructure in affected zones would be obliterated, but even a glacial maximum takes thousands of years to develop. What if the cold came back suddenly? What if snow buried the world in a matter of weeks? Level 9 between 720 and 635 million years ago, geological evidence indicates Earth experienced at least two periods of global glaciation. Glacial deposits are found at equatorial latitudes. These rocks could only have been deposited by glaciers. At the equator, the mechanism is runaway ice albedo feedback. Ice and snow reflect 50 to 90% of incoming solar radiation. When ice coverage increases, more sunlight reflects, cooling accelerates. Once ice advances past 30 degrees latitude, the feedback becomes self-reinforcing. Climate models show equatorial oceans covered by ice approximately one meter thick. Polar ice sheets would be several kilometers thick. Average global temperature, minus 68 to minus 104 degrees Fahrenheit. The carbon cycle effectively ceased. The planet remained frozen for millions of years, possibly five to 10 million years per glaciation. Volcanic activity continued, steadily emitting CO2. With continents and oceans ice covered, the CO2 accumulated unabated. Atmospheric CO2 may have reached 0.1 to 0.2 bars, roughly 350 times current levels, before the greenhouse effect melted the ice. Once melting initiated, the process reversed rapidly. Temperature swung from ice house to extreme greenhouse, potentially reaching 104 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Life survived in refugia, hydrothermal vents, cryokonite holes in ice, under ice where geothermal heat maintained liquid water. Some hypotheses suggest the extreme selective pressure drove evolutionary innovations, enabling later life diversification. This was extinction on a planetary scale. Only the most adaptable organisms survived in isolated pockets. Snowball Earth was ancient history, a phase of planetary adolescence we've outgrown. Or have we? What if it happens again? Level 10. A large-scale nuclear exchange involving 100 to 150 urban targets would ignite firestorms, injecting 5 to 150 teragrams of black carbon soot into the stratosphere. Soot particles are approximately 0.1 micrometers, suspended at 15 to 25 kilometers. At these altitudes, soot cannot be precipitated out. It forms a global aerosol layer. Climate models indicate this layer would reduce surface solar radiation by 20 to 60 percent. Surface temperatures would drop by 46.4 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit in continental interiors. Temperature drops would manifest within weeks. Precipitation would decrease by 20 to 40 percent globally. Growing seasons would shorten by 10 to 40 days. Wheat, rice, and maize production would decline by 20 to 40 percent in the first year. By year two, Production would decline by 50 to 70% below pre-war levels. Global grain reserves, 70 days of consumption. After that, famine. The soot layer persists for years to a decade. Five years of significantly reduced growing seasons would exceed the agricultural adaptability of modern civilization. Recent studies modeling regional exchanges, such as India and Pakistan involving 115 kiloton weapons, indicate even this limited scenario would cause global cooling of 33.8 to 37.4 degrees Fahrenheit. The threshold for triggering major climate disruption is lower than previously estimated. Indirect mortality would exceed direct casualties by one to two orders of magnitude. Current global population, eight billion. Agricultural production sufficient for three to four billion. The mathematics is clear. Nuclear winter wouldn't produce massive snowfall. The snow is almost irrelevant. The killing mechanism is starvation on a global scale. Famine measured in continents, in billions. Unlike every other winter on this list, this one sits waiting in silos and submarines. We'd be pulling the trigger ourselves. The weapons exist. Delivery systems are operational. Command structures in place. The decision window, if it opens, is measured in minutes. Every other catastrophic winter in Earth's history eventually ended. The question we can't answer is whether we'd survive long enough to see this one thaw.